All right, week 11, the college football season uh, off and running. Uh, as of recording, we got a couple of games here tonight to lead into a full slate on Saturday. A lot going on in the world of college football. It is crunch time, and we've got a couple of big game breakdowns along with a few best bets we're going to share with you as we welcome in three of the best all season long here in college football. It is the pen, Mr. Ralph Michaels in the house, double R, one L, Steve Merrill, and the one and only Mr. Rob Vino, ready to roll here. And I just want to put a caveat here. If Ralph Michaels and Rob Vino are on the same game, I quit. We're going to start with you here, Ralph. One more time, uh, we'll kick it off with a game tonight, Friday night here. And what should be, at the very least, an exciting one, with SMU taking on North Texas. The question is, can anybody stop anybody in this game? How are you approaching it? All right, I want to go back to Steve and Rob when next time you go to him, Joe. I tweeted this out this other day, and we were bullshitting before the show came on, guys, and we were talking about two teams with no defense. Shouldn't the NCAA mandate that it should be USC and LSU in a bowl game where we might see a total of 100. So I just want to get your guys' opinions on that when it gets to you. So, um, you, Joe, you said it. Two defenses that can't stop each other. You look at North Texas, and uh, it's, it's good to be number one unless you're the number one worst team, and that's exactly what North Texas's defense is. They're absolutely last in the NCAA, allowing 468 yards per carry. Now, 468 is a bad number, but how about if I told you that rushing defense, they're allowing 260 yards per game rushing and 5.7 yards per carry on the ground. That's against every opponent there is. This team allowed 223 yards and 6.4 yards per carry rushing to FIU on the road, and we know how bad FIU is. You look at SMU, they are my strongest group of five team as far as my power ratings go. We'd be talking about SMU in uh, a New Year's Day Bowl had they not gone to Oklahoma. When they went to Oklahoma game number two and, and lost that game 28 to 11, they actually had a two-yard edge. They outgained Oklahoma. Then they got a TCU, they put up 416 yards. The reason they lose they were minus two turnovers. So what can stop them? We'll see. Preston Jones likely to miss tonight's game. Kevin Jennings has not started a game. He's been in five or six games in backup roles, so he has some experience. But this is going to be a rush attack, rush attack, rush attack. SMU's defense, the last four weeks, 240 yards per carry, 13.5 first downs. Now, you could say those are incredible numbers, but it was against East Carolina, Temple, Tulsa, and Rice last week. So you look at SMU's offense has been dynamic. They're averaging 53 points per game at home. I went to the database and I shared this on bet on it, and I'm going to just throw it out here. When you have a home favorite of seven or higher with a total of 57 or higher, and in their last three games, they scored at least 159 points. We exclude the first four weeks of the season when you're playing non-conference foes. Those teams like SMU have gone 50 and 19 since 2006. That is 72.5%. So when a team has a red hot offense, they're the they're much better team at home as a favorite of minus or seven or more with a high total. Those teams have had a positivity. Now, I will point out this. Since 2016, there's only been a 19-game sample size, so it doesn't happen often, obviously. The team, like SMU, has covered 73.7%, but only three games have gone over the total. 14 have gone under in two pushes, so the under has actually hit. 82.4%, something you don't think about when you have that high-scoring offense. But in this game, SMU has just proven they don't mind pouring it on in the second half. I like SMU. I actually lean more in the first half. In the third quarter, they come out and they score well. But when they have a huge lead, uh, Rhett Lash Lashley has pulled starters in the fourth quarter. Mm. They do have a game at Memphis on deck. So first half for me, 
Best bet here, Friday night, SMU minus the points. Great approach there. All right, first half look. It is there for North Texas and SMU tonight. And if you are new to us here at Wager Talk TV, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. Nobody's got more college football, college basketball, NFL, you name it, we've got you covered here. Head-to-head -head matchups, best bets, previews, knowledge is power here, and we give you all of it in order to make yourself an extremely profitable handicapper. So let's do it here, Steve, double R1L Merrill. You are also going to cover a night game, and it's uh, our all-time favorite, the Late Night Degenerate Special, which is going to include Hawaii, of course it is, taking on Air Force, who I would imagine has got to be a little pissed off right about now with the 97 turnovers they just had against Army. What are you thinking? Yeah, no question about it. And uh, first of all, there's many things bad about daylight savings. And one of them is that they don't do it in Hawaii, which is actually great. And that means this is an 11 o'clock <laughs> Eastern start instead of midnight. So it is technically Saturday, which means Rob Vino will not be confused when it hits midnight and becomes a Sunday game technically on Saturday anyway. I digress. But this is an 11 o'clock Eastern start. So a little bit earlier than the normal late night Hawaii degenerate specials. But I do think there's some value in this one. I did a solo standalone video for this back on Monday earlier in the week before my database simulation was done. I mentioned in the video I leaned Air Force. I thought it was the only way to play it. I was a little disappointed when my model came back having Air Force winning by just 17 on average. Um, but this is one of the few times I'm going to give up a little bit of line value. And I think Air Force is still the right side in this game. Um, in fact, some of the sharp leading indicator books definitely show that. This is 19 in many spots, but Circa and Vegas has a minus 20. Some of the leading offshores are at 19 and a half. So I do think this will hit 20 by the time it kicks off in more locations late on Saturday night. And you mentioned that turnover fest for Air Force last week. And let's put it in perspective. Air Force came ranked top 25, undefeated, one of the few undefeated teams remaining in the country at 8 and 0, nearly a three touchdown favorite last week, and they lose 23 to 3. You told me the score was going to be 23 to 3. I would have thought for sure Air Force was the team winning by 20 and not Army. Uh, but it was turnovers. Six turnovers, none forced. A 6 nothing turnover deficit. They still only lost 23 to 3. It was 17 nothing early in the second quarter. And when you're a run only team that had averaged four passing attempts per game all season, kind of difficult to come back from 17 down in the second quarter. Uh, so we'll put a little asterisk next to last week's results. The question, though, becomes does Air Force have a hangover. You know, a lot of times when teams get that first loss, it is a bubble burst. They get knocked out of the top 25 uh, playoff rankings. But this is a military academy. They stay focused. They also travel extremely well. So the Hawaii trip without rest is less of a worry than it would be for a normal team. And then on top of that, they run the ball every single play, which means letdowns and lack of focus is less likely too. Um, and let's look at the matchup here. The running attack should work against the Hawaii run defense. Uh, that's given up 4.7 yards per carry this season. Uh, does look like Hawaii is wearing down. Uh, in three of their last five games, they've given up at least 217 yards or more, including 307 when they played Ralph Michaels, UNLV running Rebels. It's in their name a few weeks ago. And I think this is a matchup also that works for Air Force on defense. You know, normally the service academies aren't very athletic in the backfields, in our, the uh, defensive backfields, but Air Force has been great against the pass this year. They've given up just 5.9 yards per pass against teams that average 6.7. Hawaii averages 6.7, and they throw the ball basically all the time. They only run for 65 rushing yards. This is one of the only times in modern college football that it's a 100% lock that you know which team is mm. going to win the rushing battle. And when you have that kind of information, it's usually pretty handy. Uh, Air Force dominates the line of scrimmage here, and they shut down Timmy Chang's one-dimensional offense. I like Air Force minus the 19 on Saturday night. All right, looking for Air Force to get it done. Bounce back in a big way. We switch over to Mr. Rob Vino. Talking about bouncing back, I don't know. Is there a bounce back in store for uh, for OU this weekend, who not won, but two straight losses here. No more uh, national championship conversation for them. Taking on a West Virginia squad who's been pretty good with their uh, once their quarterback uh, came back into the rotation. What do you think of this one here? Well, first off, in, in response to Ralph, I can't wait to go bet over 89 and a half in an LSU USC bowl <laughs> game. That would be tremendous. Yes. Um, <laughs> and in response to Steve Merrill, listen, I'm easily confused. So you don't have to point it out to the audience every time you get a chance. Um, the West Virginia, Oklahoma game. I'm going to look at here, guys. 
you know, when, when we submit these plays for the show, um, you know, a couple hours before showtime, this total was 58. It's now 60. Um, it's gotten some run. That's the side I'm on. I played it over 58. I'm going to give you a few reasons why here. I'll start with West Virginia. And to me, they just continue to be undervalued, especially where the totals market is concerned. This is a team that in their last four games, they've put up 37 points and 567 yards against BYU. That was last week. 41 points and 450 yards against Central Florida. 34 points, 475 yards against Oklahoma State, and 39 points in that unforgettable game against Houston where they lost at the very end of it. They gained 546 total yards. If you average that out, the last four games West Virginia's played, they're averaging 35.3 points per game and 509.5 total yards worth of offense. And, you know, to me, the Oklahoma defense – is not what we thought it might be first five games of the year under Brent Venables. Where West Virginia is concerned on the season, they're averaging 5.5 yards per play, but you can see these numbers just ticking up, up, and up. Last three games are up to 6.6. Season average, they were running 71.4 points per play or 71.4 snaps per game, and that total last three games is up to 75. They become quicker, they become more efficient, they become high scoring against a defense that has really been you know, beaten up pretty good in Big 12 play. The past four games, the Oklahoma Sooners defense, how about they've allowed 31 points a game and they've given up 472 total yards a game. That combo mixes real well for a high-scoring effort out of West Virginia. And I don't think there's any doubt Dylan Gabriel and the Oklahoma offense are going to get back on track here. Now, you know, the, the concern you run into is does OU let down? after losing what could be the final Bedlam game. Um, You know, I I think, I still think Oklahoma State takes that game a little more serious than OU does. OU takes OU Texas the most serious. I think they'll bounce back. They're number 14 in plays per game. They're number 14 in yards per play. They're number 13 in plays per second. You're going to get tempo. You're going to get chances. You're going to get opportunity to score here. Dylan Gabriel and company should find openings against West Virginia. They're not a rock-solid defense by any Uh, stretch of the imagination. And if I just look at point totals that have been accumulated, Oklahoma's last five games, the point totals have landed 70, 64, 60, 71, and 51. So four of the five have gone over the asking price here of 60. And for West Virginia, much the same, three of their four have gone over 60 points. I'm going to play it that way, guys. I think that, uh, you know, until West Virginia's offense starts being accounted for a little more, This Big 12 is turning into like the Big 12 of 2009 to 2017 where you get nothing but shootouts or maybe even prior to 2009. I think we get another shootout here. I'll play it over 60. All right. Playing up and over, expecting points there in a Big 12 matchup. So there you got it. Three big game breakdowns. We got three best bets coming your way, and we're going to kick it back to the pen. Mr. Ralph Michaels to start us off here on this uh, best bet train. What do we got? with an SEC big matchup between Arkansas and Auburn here. Who do you like in this matchup? Well, if you think you could figure out college football, just think about this. Hugh Hugh Freeze, his last three years as head coach at Mississippi, goes 0-3 against Arkansas, losing by a combined 127-82. to Then he goes to Liberty, and beats Arkansas last year. So Hugh Freeze knows this team very well. So, you know, Auburn has that as an advantage. But I look at this Arkansas team, and yes, they've been horrible. You you look at six straight losses before the Florida win, but you look at their schedule. There's going to be a lot of teams that go 0-5 playing at LSU versus Texas A&M at Jerry World, at Mississippi, at Alabama, then after that, having to host Mississippi State. So you look at the team and you say, well, what's changed? Well, what's changed is this. Uh, Joe, I know last year, at the end of the year as a Miami Hurricanes fan, uh, when they got rid of Dan Enos, you were popping champagne corks. Well, Dan Enos just got fired as the OC of Arkansas. And what happens? They bring in Kenny Guyton, who has never called plays in his life, 
Arkansas last week, a season high 481 yards. They put up 39 yards against Florida. Now it does help that they have uh, their healthy running back now, Sanders. Uh, Sanders with only 194 yards in the season. He missed almost five games in two different stretches. So yes, I have an uptick in Arkansas's offense. Yes, they've played a tougher schedule. Auburn's played a very tough schedule as well. But Auburn's offense, to me, needs much more work now. You look at what Auburn has done, and yes, they put up 416 yards against Mississippi State, and they put up 424 yards against Vanderbilt last week. But to me, it's not a positive. Auburn had, I think, four plays of 50 yards or more. The last time Auburn had four plays of 50 yards or more, it was the 1960s. This just isn't a big play offense. I would say if a team is going to drive down the field, have eight or 10 play drives and long, substantial drives, moving the chains with three points, that to me is an offense that has improved. When you all of a sudden are playing the worst team in the SEC and maybe one of the worst, maybe the worst power five team in the country, and all of a sudden you just break some tackles, that to me isn't a positive offensive performance. They only had 14 first downs. I look at the offenses, again, both teams at the bottom of the barrel relative to what they average versus their other opponents. Defenses, Arkansas has a slight edge. With Arkansas at home, this team is still playing for Sam Pittman. Auburn playing back-to-back -back road games for the first time this season. I have Arkansas minus the short number to get the win. All right. Look at Arkansas. A little change there. Go back to what uh, was working pretty well uh, a year ago. Seems to have done wonders for Arkansas here. So that brings us to Mr. Steve Merrill here, who's going to take a look here, Merrill, for a best bet. Uh, and I know this game uh, had to have been in your top 25 video, is it not? Well, technically, Joe, it should not have been, but I don't believe in rules. I do like numbers, but I don't believe in <laughs> rules because USC, for the first time all season, is not a top 25 team anymore. But it was a game that was just a bit outside for making the cut because USC is getting additional votes in both polls. They're actually technically ranked 28th. So, yes, Joe, you're right. It was in my top 25 video as a bonus game. And one of the reasons I brought it up in the video, not just because it barely missed the cut, but because I do like Oregon in this spot. And I know that minus 15 was scaring a lot of people away yesterday on Thursday when I released my top 25 video. Well, now it's minus 16 as we get closer to the weekend on Friday. So I wanted to do a little update here and let you know I still like Oregon because, as I mentioned yesterday, when I released my uh, simulation ratings on this game, 10,000 games rated through the database, run through the database, average margin of victory, Oregon by 23 points in this game. So I still don't think this line is high enough. As long as it stays below those key numbers of 17, even 20, 21, I like the value with Oregon. And yes, you do worry about a backdoor cover with a team like USC that can throw for nine and a half yards per pass, 45 and a half points per game. But I'll make the counter argument that I think a front door cover by Oregon is actually more likely in this game for a couple of reasons. First of all, USC cannot stop anybody. That's been well documented. Uh, they've now gone over the total in nine of their 10 games this season. Uh, they've now lost seven in a row against the spread. And that's because they've given up 101 points the last two weeks alone to Cal and Washington. And now you've got an explosive Oregon team that's very good at moving the ball. Keep in mind, they put up 81 yards and over 700 yards of offense in week one against Portland State, 81 to 7. No, by the way, two weeks later, Portland State beat somebody 91 nothing, an NAIA team, North American University, Rob Bino's grad school alma mater. And so this is a really good Oregon team. And the difference in this game is that Oregon's a very good defensive team also. So I think they actually pull ahead in this one, and they have plenty of motivation and need to do so because they are right out on the outside looking in right now in the top four rankings because of that loss at Washington. And that was a good loss. In fact, I thought they were the better team. They lose by three as a three-point road dog, missed a field goal late that could have forced overtime, and still outgained Washington by over 100 yards. I have Oregon as one of the best teams in the country, and they have plenty of motivation to win this one big. And I think so, and you also have to worry – about USC's motivation after the tough win against Cal and then the loss against Washington. I think that was their bowl game last week, and I think Oregon rolls in this one. Take a look at the Oregon Ducks, minus 16. That's your late game Saturday night at 10.30 Eastern on Fox National TV. And if you want my official best bet this Saturday, including my Sunday NFL best bet, college and pro basketball, my first two college basketball best bets go tonight on Friday. NBA's been red hot for several years now. 
Check it out, stevemerrillwagertalk.com to get an instant $50 discount on any 30-day package with promo code ALL30. Full details on my page, stevemerrillwagertalk.com. All right, just what we need, more tears from Caleb Williams. All right, Merrill, good stuff there. How about it, Rob Vino? Look at he just wants to see the kid cry. That's all he wants to do there. Uh, finish us up here, Vino. Uh, final best bet of the week, college football and uh, another interesting game here do we know who the quarterbacks are going to be in this one for rice as they get ready to take on utsa yeah we're going to play utsa here joe uh minus the 13 and a half and upon the news this morning that broke that jt daniels is now gone from questionable to doubtful still in concussion protocol doesn't look like he'll be able to go here. He did return to the game last week and let a touchdown drive and couldn't remember the drive. Um, so after that, they took him out of the game. And they're going to likely go with Chase Jenkins, the backup who uh, substituted for him last week. Chase Jenkins, I guess you would call him more of a dual threat because his bigger asset is his ability to run than Daniels. Daniels more of the pure pocket passer. Um, but Jenkins certainly inexperienced and in a very big game on the road here against UTSA. I think, you know, when you look at Rice this season, it's really obvious the reason why they're competitive in any game um, so far this year is because JT Daniels in the passing game. JT Daniels, um, very good timing with his entire receiving core. In fact, if you look at Rice statistically from the offensive perspective, you find out that they're 22nd in the nation in passing. 126 out of 133 in rushing and 75.3 percent of their total yardage comes from the passing game and Mm. so now you're going to ask chase jenkins to do what jt daniels does and i just don't know that it's possible against this particular opponent which has gone five and oh since their bye week i think the start the year we saw frank harris the longtime quarterback of utsa banged up he didn't look right they got a bye week after not looking good offensively, came back, scored 49 against Temple, and it's been all smooth sailing for UTSA since then. 5-0 and straight up, 4-1 and against the spread. Their wins inside the conference have been by 15, 21, 26, 14, and then last week by 8 over North Texas. They're going to take on a Rice defense that if you take away, I, I apologize ahead of time to our producer, Robert Harris Jr., for mentioning this on air. But if you minus out Rice's game against Texas Southern, where Texas Southern could only score seven points, East Carolina, one and eight East Carolina, which, by the way, ranks 131 out of 133 in total offense. They only scored um, 10 against Rice. And then Tulsa, which scored 10 against Rice as well, and Tulsa had multiple quarterback problems in that game. You find that the other six games that are left, Rice has allowed 37.3 points per game, and they gave up 38 to UConn. I just don't know how they're going to hold up against Frank Harris and this UTSA offense now that it's humming. I think under two touchdowns is a reasonable price here for a team that's been winning by double digits um, habitually the last five weeks. I'm going to play it that way, guys. Not a lot of Um, thought process into this other than matchups and quarterback for Rice. And I'll add in that Texas San Antonio is one of three teams in the AAC that's 5-0 and and only two can make the championship game. UTSA will have a game against Tulane, which is also 5-0 and down the road. SMU, the other 5-0 and team. So every win is critical. I think UTSA scores big here against a Rice defense that really is um, defenseless, so to speak. I think they get to 40 plus and cover this one pretty easily. So give me UTSA minus 13 and a half. All right. UTSA hey, Joe. runners. It is for Rob Vino. Yes, Rob. My son very rudely calls me in the middle of the show because he has to Why? tell me Harbaugh is now suspended for the rest of the regular season. So that's breaking yep. news. Well, but th- well. this is what they said. He's allowed to be with the team practicing, but he can't be with the team on Saturday during the game. So uh, the Ohio State conspiracy theorists will say the Big Ten wants Ohio State to win, right, to, to cause yeah. the suspension now. <laughs> and and I'm, uh, as I'm watching the, uh, the live odds page at wagertalk.com, it hasn't moved uh, an inch, uh, not one. Uh, a couple, one a couple the of the uh, – Apparently uh, – Joe, a couple of what I'd say are the sharper much. books – Went to four, though. <laughs> a couple of them have just gone to four as we're talking right now. So 
I would say if you know, it's more I, likely to hit four. You, maybe if you half. got fours right now showing up, I I still I'm sticking four and a halfs and fives across the board. The total also ain't moving very much. Are those anybody really giving credit for a high powered offense? And uh, didn't we just go through this though? Didn't wasn't he MIA for the first couple of games of the season? First, so he's going to miss first, the first three, three games this year. Yeah, and he's yeah. yeah, but the they didn't cover three. any of those. If you recall, they they went under and failed to cover all three of those wins, and then they started going over and covering right after he got back. For what it's worth, but that, those are also against cupcakes. You know, I don't. And they were also. We'll I, I, you can make an argument points, not having so. your field general out there in your biggest game of the year is not a plus, <laughs> but we'll see. I uh, no, no, on the road too, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Michigan with or without Harbaugh, still going to have to execute to get it done against Penn State on the road. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting. There won't be. Any panning of the camera to Harbaugh in the building there uh, in Penn State. So lucky for uh, – sorry, Network. Sorry about that. But there you go. Plenty going on here this week. Week 11 of the college football season. And, uh, again, we got so much more to go here. We told you top 25, top 50 head-to-head matchups coming up this week. They're just a click away if you go ahead and click on. That video on your screen right now, you'll gain access to all of these big matchups here and then make plans to come back and join us again on Monday as we get ready for the final stretch of the regular season in college football. Until then, on behalf of Ralph, Steve, and Rob, we appreciate it, guys. Best of luck with all the plays. We'll see you again next week.